You know, you wake up in the morning, you get dressed, you put on your shoes, you head out into the world. Uh, you never think you're going to be the guy who doesn't make it home that night. And one morning I woke up. Uh, I couldn't even really call it waking up. It was more like breaking through the ice into a lake of frozen hurt. I was just drenched in pain. I looked down. I was not uh, wearing any of my own clothing. I had an oxygen mask on with a tube going up my nose, down my esophagus, into my stomach to drain it. I had chest tubes, one coming out in between my ribs under each arm, draining my lungs. I had a morphine drip, a catheter, various other IVs, and a um, life support machine beeping and clicking next to me. At the foot of my bed was the surgeon who had spent all night uh, trying to save my life. And he had, uh, he had given me a 2% chance of living. Next to him was the district attorney, and next to him were two homicide detectives. Uh, NYPD had given my case to homicide because they didn't expect me to live and they didn't want to do the paperwork swap uh, once I died. Um, I can tell you if your morning starts with two homicide detectives explaining what happened to you the night before, it's going to be downhill from there. It turns out that a gang had come in from Brooklyn as part of an initiation. Uh, three members had to kill somebody to move up in the gang. There were two other guys with them to kind of supervise and, and witness. And it was a deserted night, about 2 a.m. I was walking down Bleecker Street and turned on to Thompson and walked into their ambush. Uh, on the right was a guy with a knife with a 10-inch blade. On the left was a guy with a knife with a 6-inch blade. And then there was the other guy in the middle. Um, among very many lucky things that night, uh, when I was at the University of Notre Dame, I was on the boxing team. As soon as they pounced on me, I instinctively put my hands up, uh, which saved my life. The 10-inch uh, knife was going for my throat, ended up going into the hilt uh, in my neck. Um, he pulled that out and then went in for my gut under my elbow. That knife went in here. The other guy on the left was going like a sewing machine up my back, in, out. The guy in the middle was kind of frozen, and so I hit him as hard as I could with a textbook straight right, knocked him out. Um, they caught him, and uh, he gave up everybody else. So they had five young men in custody, and the DA was there uh, with mug shots, and they wanted to get me to identify the guys before uh, I died. And I didn't feel like I could do that. Uh, you know, the morphine, it was dark the night before. I just said to them, you know, guys, I, I, can't, uh, I can't do this, really. And so as they're filing out, the second detective looks at me and he says, buddy, I've been on the force 17 years. I've never seen anybody get hit with the kind of knives you got hit with and live. What do you eat? <laughs> um, so I was on life support for about four days. Um, they took me off life support and moved me into the not going to die room on, uh, ice, in the ICU. And then the nurse comes in with the clipboard to talk, about, talk to me about my insurance. Um, I was self-employed at the time, so I was insurance free. And um, <laughs> she was not happy to hear that. Uh, the next morning, she came in and told me that it's unbelievable how good I was doing and that I really just ought to continue to get better at home. And they just started pulling the tubes out, and they gave me a bag to put my stuff in, and a cane, and a bottle of Percocet, and sent me on my way. And so I found myself at home in my apartment, um, caught between these two incredible feelings. One is, I can't believe I'm alive. I'm, I'm, you know, I had found out over the course of the week. I had had two collapsed lungs. Um, they took out about 13 feet of my intestines, organs that I didn't know that I had. If you know anything about anatomy, uh, your inferior vena cava is this garden hose sized vein that brings all your blood back to your heart. That was cut. Um, basically, I had like 40 units of blood uh, to keep me in place. And I, I, I just had this feeling of being the luckiest person I, I had ever known. 
combined with the nightmares and the flashbacks and these just unbelievable sense of panic. And I'm there in my apartment and I would go out to get some milk and at the deli on the corner, I would see the flowers in the, uh, you know, in the buckets. And they would just, like, out of uh, Fantasia, they would just be singing. And, and I was just like, oh my, well, I can't believe I get to uh, exist. I'm still here. I'm just so lucky. And then I'd see, you know, if you saw a teenager with any hint of menace, which is all of them, um, <laughs> I would have this sense that I'm going to be attacked, I'm, I'm gonna be stabbed, I'm going to be murdered. And, and in my head, the intellectual side would be saying, no, dude, this is not gonna happen. You, you know, it's, you're okay, you're safe now. And the reptilian cortex would be going, fuck that, the last time, we are not taking, you know, we're just react. And the heart goes, and the pulse, and the eyes, and like focus, and panic. And I guess the way to describe it is if you're driving at night, in the winter on a snowy road, you may be going a little too fast, you're coming into a turn, and all of a sudden you feel all the wheels slip, and you see the guardrail coming, and you just know, I can't brake, I don't have steering, I'm going too fast, I am gonna hit the guardrail, and then the wheels, all of a sudden they grip, not because of anything you did, but you hit, a, you hit black ice, and then you hit the dry road, and the steering wheel shutters, you're back in control, and you're driving down the highway and you're like, nothing happened. And then you get hit. You feel the rusty taste in your mouth, the trembling behind your knees, the sweaty palms. I was having that feeling six, eight, ten times a day, uh, evening, uh, waking up, being stabbed, on life support. And I just began to I, I didn't know what post-traumatic stress was, and I didn't uh, have any idea about how it would affect me, and they didn't really give me any brochure on the way out of the hospital. So I couldn't continue to work, and in New York, if you don't work and pay your rent, you don't get to stay in your apartment. And I found myself in housing court um, saying to the judge, I, I was nearly uh, murdered this year. Please don't make me homeless. And he said, you know, we're very sorry. Uh, there's just not anything we can do. And so I came home one day to find the uh, marshals had put all of my possessions in black plastic bags on the sidewalk. And, you know, as somebody that came to New York, and built a little uh, business and tried to, you know, bring my talent here to, uh, find fame and fortune or fulfillment or whatever it was. There's nothing that makes you feel like New York doesn't want you <laughs> like than that. And then I had a meeting with the uh, district attorney because I had now five attempted murder trials that I was supposed to go to to help put these guys uh, away. And I'm in, in the office and I just break down. I, I start to cry and I say, you know, I, I don't, I'm homeless. And the DA, you know, I hadn't said anything, like all this time, I kept thinking to myself, I'm gonna get back to my, I'm gonna get back to everything, right? These guys aren't gonna win. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reclaim all of my, my, my business and I'm, I'm getting my health and everything. And it just wasn't working out. And so, but I, I hadn't complained. I didn't wanna be a complainer. I just, I was so lucky. So the DA gives me a number uh, for the victim's assistance people. A little late, I thought, um, but, <laughs> I went uh, without an appointment or anything down to their office. I'm sitting in their lobby waiting and this young girl comes out to help me. She looks like Reese Witherspoon and Legally Blonde. She's got a black turtleneck and a blonde ponytail and clipboard and she brings me back to her uh, cubicle. And as we're walking back, I'm just thinking she is not gonna understand the very dark place I'm in and she's just not gonna have a way to help me. When I get to her cubicle, it's kind of confirmed because behind her monitor pinned up is that poster, I know you know it, of the kitten on the branch. <laughs> and it just says, hang in there, baby. And she gives me, uh, you know, paperwork to fill out for Medicaid and uh, signs me up on a list for subsidized housing as an 18-month wait, but at least you're on the list. 
gives me an address uh, and, and some numbers for uh, group, free group counseling I can go to in the Bronx. And I'm looking at this stack of papers and her, and I just, I feel like I'm a drowning man who has just been thrown a kit to build a boat. And I gather my manila folders up and I, I, and I walk out and I, I go to my favorite bartender who is this um, beautiful uh, Lebanese Canadian poet. Um, she pours a mean double uh, whiskey. You've got to go down like a hummingbird to take the top off before you can pick it up. And she listens to me as I, as I describe what's, what's going wrong. Uh, which is very unusual because most people in my life at that point when I tried to talk, they had one of three responses. The first response typically, and they meant well, but it was absolutely no help, was everything happens for a reason. <laughs> which made me want to punch them in the face and ask <laughs> if they knew what the reason for that was. The second thing that people would say <laughs> is, you've just got to put this behind you. You've got to get over it. You're, you're alive. You just need to carry on. And that made me want to stab them six times <laughs> and then call them up in six months and go, so, uh, you got any advice for me now? Because I really could use, uh, I could hear from somebody who knows what the heck they're talking about. <laughs> and the third thing, which again, everyone meant well, but it was absolutely no use, was whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> and I read Nietzsche, I went to college, I sat up all night in the student union, I thought it was cool, like, you know, whatever doesn't kill you, man, makes you stronger. And it just wasn't working out like that. I, I, I felt like I had been broken, like life had taken me and broken me. And not only would I never be stronger, but I would never, ever have what I had before. And I was going around trying to get jobs, I kept getting fired, I would just burst into tears at meetings, you know, that's not a way to keep your job, and I got fired again and again, and my girl that let me move in with her, the bartender, is just getting nervous because I'm just this mad guy, you know, she let the sad guy move in, but now he's this mad guy, and so I got fired, and I'm sitting on this park bench on Fifth Avenue, I see this dude walking by with a shiny briefcase and his Hermes tie and his $100 haircut and his perfect suit. And I just think, I want to tackle that fucker and just beat him and just j kneel on his chest and punch him in the face and say, you're so smug. You think that you're so good and everything you're doing is keeping you where you are, but you are just lucky. Man, in one day, you could lose it all, no matter how good you think you are. I, I'd let him go, but um, <laughs> that, that, feeling that I had at that moment was a, was a shock. And, and to this day, to the remembering that I, I am at this moment closer to the guys who tried to kill me, I just wanted to hurt an innocent bystander to make a point about what was wrong in my life. And I've lost the guy that I was. I, he's, not, he's not there anymore. And I know that I don't want to be the guy that, that I am at that moment. And then I think to myself, this is it. I can't get back what I had. I can't go on from there. I just have to, it's, a, it's, it's over. That guy didn't make it out of the hospital. But I don't want to be this guy. And I've got this girl at home. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change. I'm going to just start a new thing. So I run home to her and I'm like, you're not going to believe. I just had this idea. Will you marry me? She's like, no. <laughs> you, need, you need a little more work there. So she knows I'm never going to ask her again. Um, and after about a year and a half and some good work and, you know, medication and um, she asked me. So we get married and, uh, you know, we start to build uh, a life together. Um, she goes to law school, uh, becomes a public defender, and then we just decide uh, to do the most audacious thing possible and have a kid. And given what I know about world history, my history, 
Um, just the idea of uh, creating a life that we're going to um, send out into the world, uh, it's, it's terrifying. But every morning, I get up, I get dressed, I put on my shoes, I put on her shoes, and we head out into the world. 